The following program contains a topic which may not be suitable for young viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Tori Bowman. Intimacy and relationships are important aspects of our lives, but that doesn't make it easy to talk about. Despite these challenges, many people with disabilities are breaking new ground by openly sharing their experiences and advocating for the right to sexual expression. We're here today to add to this open dialogue. On this episode of Underestimated, presented by Oatley Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers and brought to you by Spinal Cord Injury Ontario, recreation therapist and sex educator Rochelle Manet will share her thoughts on sexuality, identity, and exploring new ways of thinking about sex and connection as a person who identifies as queer and living with a disability. Oda catches up with Andrew Gerza, co-founder of Bumpin', a sex toy company for and by people with disabilities, and host of the award-winning podcast, Disability After Dark, to chat about being seen and exploring pleasure as a person with a disability. And Andrew Brawny shares his experience with intimacy and communication after a spinal cord injury, including his tips for asking and answering awkward questions and figuring out how to make things work. Rochelle Manette is a sex educator, certified therapeutic recreation specialist, and the host of That Sex Show on AMI-tv. We're pleased to welcome her from her home in Halifax. Welcome to the show, Rochelle. Thank you for having me. Okay, for starters, could you introduce for us what is a sex educator and how did you become one? Yeah, so a sex educator really is someone who teaches people about sex in any capacity. There's so many different kinds of sex educators that exist, um, often who talk about different topics or specialize in different topics. Uh, and the topic that I specialize in is very much sex and disability. Um, and with like a queer lens woven in because that is my own experience. Um, yeah, how did I become a sex educator? That is a long and winding road of a story, but essentially I went to do my degree to become a rec therapist. And then somewhere within that, I came out as queer. Um, and I just felt like I didn't have any education that really explained to me what queer sex was supposed to look like. Uh, so I went to a workshop and in that workshop, of course, there was a sex educator and I was just blown away by the idea that someone could do that like for their life. Uh, and since then, I had kind of found all these different avenues to become a sex educator through the work that I was already doing and the opportunities that I had. Uh, and so, yeah, after I was done my undergrad and got my certification, I decided to do a master's degree. And with that, I studied uh, people's experiences with acquired physical disability and how that impacted their sexuality. So. I mean, I know you did a whole master's thesis on this, but what would be the, you know, the bottom line or the short version of, of what you learned as far as the impact of disability on people's experience of their sexuality? Yeah, so as I was doing my master's, I think a lot of what was coming up was also pretty prominent for my life. At the time, I was also starting to experience disability for the first time, so it was very intense research, but it did feel like we were all kind of going through it together. Um, but one of the things that came up for a lot of people, and also for me, um, was First of all, the fact that people wanted to prioritize their pleasure, that's what I named my thesis, something about prioritizing pleasure, um, in that it was super important. And a lot of the time in, you know, healthcare, especially like in rehab related healthcare or sort of in, you know, pain management type healthcare, there's an expectation that we work on the things that have to do with our daily life, making sure we can dress ourselves or eat or like go to work. Uh, but something that gets missed a lot is how we have fun, how we enjoy ourselves. Uh, and the rec therapist in me was like, that's important too, obviously. Uh, that's pretty much the basis of rec therapy is we want people to enjoy the lives that they're leading and not just do the things that feel like they have to do. Um, and yeah, and in my mind, sex was a part of that. And so a lot of people felt very strongly about wanting to prioritize their sexuality in some capacity. And the other piece, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so, so walk me through that then. What do you do when you're, when you're working with folks about 
prioritizing pleasure and bringing a disability lens to that, what do you what do you do? I know you brought a few um, items for show and tell with you. <laughs> yes. Maybe you can, uh, give us a bit of a flavor of what that's like. Yeah. So you know, before the toys even come out, I ask people to think about like what sex means for them. You know, in the world that we live in, in you know, our sort of like ex expectations around what sex means, being straight, being able-bodied, a lot of those things kind of weave together to give us a really unrealistic expectation of what our bodies are supposed to do. So a big part of like the first step is really you know, exploring sex outside of these really specific lenses that we've sort of been told sex is supposed to be. Um, and one of my favorite tools to do that is sex toys. Uh, and so I did bring a couple of my favorites, uh, you know, something like the magic wand. This is a real big toy. Uh, it kind of looks like a microphone. Um, and these have been around for forever. I think it just celebrated its 55th anniversary of existing, uh, originally meant to be a back massager, and then people did what they felt like doing with it, and I am so for that. <laughs> but yeah, and it's really nice and strong, and it's a way to you know, use something else that we maybe didn't think of using before. And then I also have this smaller vibrator that just has a nice angle to it, so it can be good for helping with reach and things like that. Um, but generally what I like about vibrators is that our bodies don't naturally produce the types of vibrations that a sex toy would. And so introducing something new to you know, the pot, something that we haven't tried before, can be a fun way to explore new sensations uh, and just recognize that sex doesn't have to look like one specific thing. It can look like a whole bunch of different things and it can include toys or it doesn't have to. Um, yeah, and that we can make it more comfortable for ourselves if we don't have to bend into ridiculous positions. Uh, or we can use things like pillows just to, you know, put our bodies into places that are more comfortable. Um, and yeah, that's a big part of it. We should be comfortable when we're having sex if we can. How does communication factor in when you're, um, when you're, I guess, talking with people about this or exploring new ways of thinking about sex and sexuality? Yeah, so I do a lot of consent education. Uh, and, you know, I think our ideas of consent are very much meant to avoid like getting in trouble or meant to avoid harm. But for me, the basis of consent is every person likes something different. Every person thinks that sex is something different or experiences pleasure in a different way. And in order to actually like enjoy what we're doing with another person, we should be asking them what they like and maybe like boundaries that they have, things that are off the table, positions that are comfortable for them or you know, just places to touch. Uh, and so I feel like that really is the basis of all sexuality in a sense, like having the opportunity to talk about what sex looks like and to figure out what's gonna feel good and to problem solve, lots of problem solving that needs to happen. Because we all have different interests and you know, just assuming that someone likes what you like is gonna probably end in not a super fun time. Maybe it will, but you won't know unless you ask about it first. Okay, and the biggest misconception, if there was one thing that you could just totally eradicate right now, a, a myth that gets in people's way, what would it be? I think the biggest one, especially when it comes to sex and disability, is this idea that sex is supposed to be spontaneous, that like I should be able to lock eyes with someone across the room and they immediately know that I want to have sex with them. And like that happens in movies and it's fun to watch, but that's already scripted. Like they know what each other wants because it, it was written down in a script. Mm -hmm. uh, sex is never spontaneous. I mean, like what I want to have sex might be spontaneous, but the actual act of it needs to have some planning and communication and, you know, just so that I know what I'm getting into and I know what I want to do All for right. Makes sense. Thank you so much, Rochelle. So if people want to learn more, wh where could they go? Where could you uh, direct people to learn more about um, this type of educational opportunity? Yeah, so I work for a uh, an educational uh, sex shop and bookstore called Venus Envy. Uh, you can find us at venusenvy.ca. Uh, and if you're specifically looking to talk about sex and disability, you can just email whoever and ask for me, and I'm happy to <laughs> chat more about it. Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers are proud sponsors of Underestimated. If you need a personal injury lawyer, we can help. For more information, please visit OatleyVigman.com. 
On Rogers TV, we have a reality show like no other. It has a great cast of characters. Some you may have even helped land the role. Each episode has something different. Plans are devised, decisions are made, votes are cast, and money is spent. It's local reality TV that you won't want to miss. And it's exclusive to Rogers Cable customers. Catch your municipal council coverage on Rogers TV. Visit rogerstv.com for broadcast details. Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. My name is Andrew Gerza. I'm 39, living downtown Toronto. I live with spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, and I'm a disability awareness consultant. There are so many myths and misconceptions when it comes to sex and sexuality and disability. The primary one being that we can't have sex, um, that we don't want to have sex, that if you have sex with me, you're going to be my caregiver, um, that if you have sex with me, you're going to hurt me, um, that if that I because I'm disabled automatically I can't consent to sex. Um, there's a whole gamut of myths and, and misconceptions, for sure. The misconceptions around intimacy are so big around sex and disability because people are afraid of it. They don't think it's gonna happen to them. They don't think that it's like, oh no, a disabled person must be so sad all the time, they can't wanna have sex or intimacy. And so like, um, I, the way I handle the misconception is through humor. So I'll use like, hey, I'm a bear in a chair. I'll use like, hey, wanna like touch my joystick. I'll, I'll use like humor to like play with the fact that I know I'm disabled, I know I have these needs but it doesn't mean we can't have a good time. Because I think people assume that, well, I know they assume that being disabled is tragic. And so to try to show them that like, yes, things work differently. And yeah, there are hard moments around it. Of course there are, but it doesn't mean that I don't want intimacy and I don't deserve it. It means that like, I just have to do it differently. Intimacy for me as a disabled person means I have to rely on someone else to help me access the intimacy. So it's tough, well not tough, but it's different because it isn't as spontaneous and as like quick as we assume intimacy is supposed to be. It's a lot more control, a lot more disgust, there's a lot more um, discussion about what has happened before, before I actually can, can engage in the intimacy. So in terms of spontaneity, I just switch it around. I'm like, how sexy would it be if you if you could plan out your your intimacy or your connection with somebody and like to to have a plan like when i when i see somebody we usually set a day and a time and so like i know on saturday at two i get to have intimacy like that's kind of hot and so instead of relying on oh wow it had to be this spontaneous thing it's like oh no i get to like set it up to be this fun intimate moment I try to just be myself and I also know that like so much of disability representation is often times inspirational and oftentimes like yeah I can do anything I'm a warrior and, and, and all that's great and that's good for like certain people for me it's like no I want to just tell the truth or my truth rather and tell like how you know how, how I live my life and so I think putting that stuff online for me is almost like a journal of like today I was doing this I want to share and I think you know, knowing that me sharing my story as a queer disabled person can help someone else be like, oh wow, I feel seen here. I, my experiences are being talked about here too. Like that's, there's something really powerful in that. So I try to, I try to think about who I wanted 15 years ago, like who I wanted to know 15 years ago is who I can be now to ensure that like the next generation of queer cripples out there are trying to do this and trying to like navigate intimacy and sexuality have a, ba a baseline to be like, oh, I follow Andrew Gerzer, I follow others like him, and so now I feel seen. I worked with a friend of mine who was d 
to his non adult film and a studio from the States that I had done some work for, himrose.tv, contacted me and said we were doing, it's our two year anniversary of being a studio and we, and we want amateur porn stars to do, to, to film stuff in their bedrooms and we know you want to do representation around disability, would you want to do one? And I was like, uh, sure, like, okay, great, awesome, this is kind of cool. Because I've been working in sexuality and disability for years at that point, talking about how we need representation of disability in adult film. And I was like, wow, this opportunity like fell in my lap. So I had to, I immediately was like, sure. Talked to my friend that I had done some sexy things with. And I was like, listen, can we, would, would you do this with me for representation? And so that, it was really cool because I got to show how I get out of bed, how I, how I use a special lift to be transferred to access sexuality. And we showed all that as part of the video and still made it sexy and fun. And it was really, really, important because people have now used the film as part of their like when they're training sexual therapists to learn about how to help the body sometimes they'll use my film and that's kind of cool to be like look here's a severely disabled person having sex wow amazing like I think the fact that that you know and we shot this in my bedroom like in my house on a Tuesday afternoon or something so like the fact that that happened and people are using that as a, like a, ba a baseline to understand sex and disability is really cool. About seven or eight years ago now, I lost the ability to self-pleasure because of the spasticity in my hands. So it just was hurting me to self-pleasure and I couldn't do it anymore. And my sister saw the movie because it went down to Australia where she lived. And she, so then she saw the movie and I went down there a few months later to visit, to visit her. And she said, well, oh, tell me about, you know, the fact that you can't get off anymore and I was like well that's embarrassing you're my sister but okay so I, I was explaining to her like well there are no toys on the market for me that, really, that I can really hold because of the dexter my dexterity the buttons are too small I can't really access any toys and she goes surely there must be something and I was like not really I've looked and she was like well did you want to make one and at first I was like do I want to make a toy with my sister that's super weird but then when we put it out to the community we realized that 63% of the people that we polled said they have trouble with self-pleasure due to hand limitations. We were like, oh, we can do something with this. We came up with an idea for what is now the bump and joystick, um, which is like a, it's a one meter long, like it's a, like, a, it's like if a foam roller and a body pillow had a baby, it's like that. And it can hold your like, sex toys in place for you so that if you can't use your hands you can still access pleasure we're still in the we're still in the like production phase it's taken years for it to kind of go because covid happened and then factories stopped doing stuff so people are very excited about it um we are very excited about it and and we hope that you know it, it will help people access their pleasure when we were doing prototype testing we had someone say that it changed their sex life and it gave them back their sex life. So we're very excited about where it's gonna go. I think everyone deserves sex and pleasure. And I also think sex and pleasure don't have to be tied to love. What if they don't want a loving relationship right now? What if they just want to have pleasure? And I feel like we're deserving of both and we need to have discussions of pleasure around disability because when you become disabled, you're gonna want pleasure too. So we need to have the conversations now with people that live the experience today. It's something we all deserve, regardless of our ability level or our romantic status. Holy Vigman Personal Injury Lawyers are proud sponsors of Underestimated. If you need a personal injury lawyer, we can help. For more information, please visit OatleyVigman.com.
Tony. Uh, I am a 27 year old male and um, so I was injured in 2017 uh, in a motorcycle accident and then some complications with the uh, with a stint that was put in afterwards um, in the Dominican and uh, spent uh, about four months in the hospital in rehab um, and then returned home to uh, to a new to a new body and a new life. Rehab actually was they did try and help you as much as they could, but there's a lot of other stuff that are that is seen as more important. Uh, even though sexual health and, and the, the mental aspect around it is very important, uh, they spent a lot of time more on making sure that you could get around, go to the bathroom, um, you know, staying healthy, keeping your skin good. Uh, the the more day to day that you need to do versus the want to do and good for your your mental health. So coming home from rehab was, I was in a relationship, a long-term relationship, and um, my partner was very, very helpful with, uh, and, and open to exploring new ways about um, dealing with your new body and how it works, uh, and things are different. Uh, she was also very positive in, in anything uh, and help, getting help from other sources. Um, so for me that involved uh, actually talking to a doctor. There's a few things you can do on your own to try and then at some point you have to actually talk to your doctor, which is much easier than most people think. It's a fairly simple talk or simple conversation to go in and just say, hey, this is what's happening and they deal with it all the time and you're, you're not the first person that's coming with those issues. So the big questions you have to open up is that, you know, things aren't working. I need to, the first question is being like, where do I start? And uh, the, the response is as simple as, you know, try these two things. And if they don't work, there's, this is the third option. Still not surgery or anything crazy invasive, which it can get to that if, if needed, but it was very simple. Um, talked to the doctor for 20 minutes and given a prescription. And that's the base of, of helping to make things work. And obviously that doesn't make you be able to do everything, but it gives you some of the masculinity back. Definitely talking about um, uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, and that's only part of the, the issue. Um, the other being, being with um, the rest of the act, uh, of the sexual act, but it is, is main, mainly against that that um, ED or erectile dysfunction. So opening up about sexual function and, and um, intimacy, uh, it's, it's also not just about that sexual function part. Intimacy as a whole in a relationship are, are two different things. Yes, sexual function is important in a relationship, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be what TV or media says that sexual function is. Uh, it can be whatever is satisfactory to you. Uh, and learning that part is, is kind of the stepping stone that gets you, breaks you away from this is what I need to do to this is my new life that is enjoyable to me and enjoyable to my partner. And as long as you're meeting those two criteria, then the rest of it, whatever everybody else shouldn't really know about what's going on unless you're gonna talk to a camera. And <laughs> that's, uh, that's that's where it goes is that once you you figure out that it's your it's what matters to you and what matters to your partner not what matters to everybody else mm -hmm. the expectations of everybody else is that all of a sudden your your those boundaries don't exist and they can ask you anything so very often you're asked questions of oh can you still have kids oh can you still get an erection oh can you um, have sex whatever it may be uh, and people decide that these are now fair game questions, which really don't think they need to be, but learning how to answer those questions uh, in a fashion that's not demeaning to the person asking them, because honestly they're, they're asking about your well-being, uh, but it does put up that interpreted expectation that um, they're expecting that you have kids. And even today's day and age, you don't even, whether you're able-bodied or not able-bodied, there's a lot of people deciding not to have children. And that's not necessarily anybody's business, but at the same time, they, everybody sees that it's necess a necessity to ask these questions. So often I would answer them with, with, would you ask a normal person that? And sometimes if you put that with the right tone, it's not too bad, it doesn't 
make anybody too upset and they kind of go oh and my hope is that they don't ask somebody else because i'm fairly open about it but certain people would be very upset about a question like that isn't that a good picture that's a great picture so online dating is the the new the new thing that apparently is the way to date um i was was in a relationship for you know 10 years um and so it's only been over the last year or so that that i've been into online dating and representing yourself some people um in wheelchairs some people are with with a disability um they may hide it um you see all a whole spectrum of of ways people deal with it uh some people come out and just tell you that yes i have a spinal cord injury i have md i have multiple sclerosis whatever it may be that that limits their their mobility or their function or whatever situation they may be in um and then you have me i've kind of just put it there and i'm in a wheelchair so if you don't see that then well you missed it and i make it pretty obvious but it's not telling people and then there's other people that hide it completely uh and it's i, I don't think that's necessarily right yeah. but everybody has their own way to deal with it and if that's what they think is is the way to deal with it that's what they've got to do this might be the one though I generally represent myself as as um the person who I am. Um a wheelchair hasn't really slowed me down. I still uh drive a truck, ride my ATV, I hunt, I fish, I shoot. Um I've got a race car, I've I've got jet skis, uh I've got the side by side and all of these things point towards me and give me some of that uh the masculinity back and when somebody gets in the side by side beside me or is is in another side by side and we're all out on the trail together there's no difference and it takes away any of that wheelchair being a being a situation when you're meeting people you get them over and over uh I've talked to some people that are in you know able bodied people and not living with a disability and most of them uh have the same kind of situations where they're asked questions repeatedly. It's just different questions. Uh yeah, I think the ones that I'm asked are generally a little more personal than than what most people are asked over and over and over again. Uh but most of my answers uh, I'll answer honestly to an extent. Uh there there is a line where I'm kind of like maybe on the third date we can talk about that, but on the first four conver- four messages in a conversation we're not going to talk about that yet. <laughs> When I'm driving somebody's driving beside me I'm in the exact same level the exact same position that they are and there's nothing the wheelchair doesn't matter at that point or the injury doesn't matter and yes I have to I have ad- adaptive controls in in all of my vehicles um but when you're driving most people can't tell the difference It's not always easy to talk about sexuality With a spinal cord injury or disability, it may require an even higher level of trust, communication, and honesty. You have the right to quality sexual health care, and that may mean finding a doctor, nurse, or nurse practitioner who's sex positive and comfortable discussing your sexual and reproductive health issues. I want to thank all of our guests for for their willingness to share their intimate and personal stories with us. To learn more about our show, visit rogerstv.com/underestimated or visit courtry.com. I'm Tori Bowman and thanks for watching. Mm-hmm.